Perfect. Go. All right. Go ahead, Scott. Why don't you uh, introduce well, us? Th thank you, Robert. I, I noticed, I figured this was something that might be interesting to the class because it was something that happened while I was reading the Megillah, chapter nine. If we had talked to Rabbi, Rabbi Sachs had mentioned that the word is seen is some kind of corrupt Greek or English version of the corruption of the Greek Esenoi that came from some original Hebrew. We don't know what that Hebrew is, but one theory is that it comes, it could come from the word Osin, with written either with the Vav as the vowel O or without it. And it has to do with doing or making, doers. Could these people have doers, doers of what, doers of Torah? So knowing that, it's something, I've been reading this chapter nine for about five years. And I noticed something in verses 21 and 27, it talks about establishing the 14th and 15th day of Adar as a day of celebrating for the Jews and that they should keep or observe these days. So you'd think that the Hebrew word shamar, shin memoresh, would be used to keep or observe, but no. In these two verses, they have a phrase made up of two words, lihiyot osim, to be doers. But when you look at the, and here's the full sentence. So here's chapter nine, verse 21. And I've put in red text the, the two words. And it's usually translated to establish this among them, meaning the Jews, that they should keep the 14th day. You would think that this should be the word shamru or shamor or shomrim or yishmaru, but it isn't. It uses lihiyot, osim, which really means to establish upon themselves to be doers of the 14th day of the month of Adar. Same thing in verse 27. Yeah. If you scroll to that, below Yavor, you would think it would say shomrim or yishmaru. They would keep these two days according to their writing and according to their point in time from year to year. But it doesn't. It says, Lihiyotosim, that they should be doers of these two days. So it's very odd that it's repeated. It's not just used once, it's used twice in chapter nine. And it's interesting too, because in the Dead Sea Scroll, the Damascus document, they use the word nilvim, joiners, and that's also used in chapter nine. So it's just very odd. I thought this would be interesting to show that the term of being a doer isn't just something that was used probably by the Dead Sea Scrolls if it was the source of the word of sin, but it has some basis in the Tanakh. So I just wanted to share, it just dawned on me when I was reading it. Another benefit for laning Torah or Megillah, you see something you wouldn't normally see if you were just reading the translation. So I just wanted to share that and the rabbi thought it would be nice to bring it up to the class. So I leave it, you know, I, I just leave it up to you to ponder that. Okay, so thank you, Scott. That's really, that's really uh, wonderful. And in light of the fact that we mentioned last week that no one is quite really sure what exactly this term means, kind of like Byzantia historians also wonder, well, where exactly does that? There's some theories, but no one is exactly sure where it comes from. Rabbi? So, uh, uh, yes, Alan. Are there any contemporary authorities on uh, uh, this Megillah that might shed some light on the uh, Hebrew used? Yeah, Scott Slomowitz, I believe, is <laughs> contemporary. That's a great question, Alan. I didn't check Rashi or anything. I haven't looked to see if there's any, you know, commentary about that. I'm not even sure where to look because most of my Megillah is has no commentary. Yeah, uh, for instance, like in in my uh, JPS, I, I have a number of the volumes, and and in different uh, authors lead the the authorship. Of, of of these, particularly when 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 you get to the uh, to, to to the uh, writings. So, so is, is, I'm sorry, someone was trying to speak. Yeah, this is Aida. I wanted to suggest to Scott that he may want to write something about it and post it someplace, so that he can contribute to the discussion in that way. Well, you have a fan club, Scott. 
Yeah, I don't know where I would po whip, post it to what? Well, whatever the mo modern version of doing uh, well, let, Leah, this let kind me... of... You could do your own blog. <laughs> let, let me think about where one would... Uh... Okay. You know, if Scott, you know, actually what I, what I will do is I will repost, I will post it to my rabbinical organization. Uh, people okay. love commenting on these uh, theories and uh, that type of thing. Okay. Uh, but in regard to Alan's question also, I, I said Scott is the authority, but um, authority. which I actually meant seriously. But um, also there are uh, like, if you get to look at Mikra Otkadolot, that would probably be the first place to work, uh, okay. look which that's really an encyclopedic uh, collection of rabbinic commentaries. Now, I have what most people, as I have a, a Mikro Kedolo on the five books. Uh, there are other versions which have uh, commentaries to in of uh, Ketuvim and stuff like that, but they're not nearly as common. It may actually be in Sfaria, which we're using for Parsha and Pizza now. They, <coughs> they also give you commentaries. As, do you know how to use that, Scott, by voice, Sfaria? The uh, on the internet, yeah, I'll look yes. there. I'll, yeah, so I'll, if you just click on if you just click on the the pasukim, the verses you pulled out, yeah, uh, it sh they, they should take you and I'll try to look too. Those should take you directly to those commentaries. Okay. Some are in English as well, and some are just in Hebrew. So I'll take a look also. Okay, terrific. Okay. Do I need so, to return? Uh, the, do, you, do I return the screen back to you? You stop sharing. Got it. Okay. Thank. you. Okay, so uh, I'm afraid to even try to follow that. That was so scholarly. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Are you saying we should tune out? Uh, I didn't say it, but when, uh, I mean, it's, it's a tough act to follow. Let's put it. It's like the guy uh, that went after the Beatles when they came to America on the Ed Sullivan show or whatever. Okay, so, uh, but nevertheless, I'll give it my best shot. So we're looking at the rabbinic system today. Okay, so first of all, what happened? And what I mean by what happened is how did we wind up with the rabbinical system being the dominant system? That was uh, long from a far gone, uh, that was certainly not a far gone conclusion back at the time of the uh, Dead Sea sect. Only looking back, does it look obvious? Of course, the rabbis are going to Pharisees, which more or less become the rabbis are going to win. <clears throat> so as we've said simply, the Pharisees go out of business. There's no temple, their whole existence revolved around temple and sacrifices. With no temple and synagogues becoming the dominant form of worship after the temple is destroyed, there's just nothing to congregate around. Now, as we've also said, synagogues had been popping up for quite a long time before the destruction of the second temple. There are synagogues found in Greek Egypt, uh, third century BCE, and the temple is, is not destroyed until 70 of the common era. So uh, in some form or another, the synagogues had uh, developed first century common era is the earliest we could find synagogues popping up in the Eretz Yisrael. Doesn't mean they didn't exist, that's just the earliest we could document it. And they are, some of them serve as primarily study hall, some of them serves a, serve as prayer places, as we have this liturgy developing, but it's not a fixed liturgy like we have today. And I'll give you an example of how that kind of plays out. When we do the uh, Amida <coughs> during Hazat Harasha, Hazar Hashas, the repetition of the Amida, we have the regular Modin, and then we have the uh, Rabbanan, the rabbinic version that people say silently as the reader is re reciting the standard version. Or Sim Shalom, we have Sim Shalom in the morning, <coughs> and then we have Shalom Rav, for the prayer for the peace later on in the day. So how, why is it we have two different versions of the same text? Scholars think that perhaps what happened is they're well, both competing versions and instead of simply one winning and the other being lost to history, both get uh, put in and the way of kind of sharing it is they both serve slightly different functions in our liturgy. So we have these uh, different, different uh, traditions going on that really get molded together in what we would recognize as a service about 20 years after the destruction of the temple or so by uh, Rabbi Gamliel, who was the authoritative figure <coughs> shortly after the destruction of the temple. The first authoritative figure is Yochanan ben Zakkai, who's the head honcho during the destruction itself. There's the famous story about how he's, uh, how they sneak him out of, uh, how they sneak him out of Jerusalem in a coffin to speak to Vespasian 
does anyone uh, does anyone by the way have uh, i'll just tell you the story i'm not sure everyone's familiar with it and i i'll highlight the word story as in it's not historically accurate it's based on a historical truth of sorts but it's not historically accurate the story is and this part is historically true is that when Jerusalem and Jerusalem is being besieged by the Romans and the Zealots are fighting with the Romans and they're also busy fighting each other, Yochanan ben Zakkai, who's the leading rabbi, realizes they're going to lose and, and Judaism is going to come to an end unless he finds another way to carry Jerusalem, uh, carry uh, Judaism forward without having a temple. <clears throat> so the story is he wants to make peace with the Romans, and which is true. And uh, so that part is true. The part about him, how he got to the Romans is the uh, cute legend part, but it's uh, only, it's based on another true story. So the story is he wants to get to the Romans, to Vespasian, who's the Roman general as a procedure in Yerushalayim. So he realizes the zealots aren't going to let him out to speak to Vespasian. They're going to consider that an act of treason. So the story is that he has his followers put him in a coffin say to the uh, Jewish uh, guards at the walls of Jerusalem, we have a dead body, we want to take him outside the city of a burial, as w is, uh, is the custom. And they take out the coffin, bring him to the Romans, to Vespasian, and he pops out of the coffin and says, let me build the yeshiva in Yavna. So undoubtedly Vespasian said something like, what is the yeshiva? And he oh, it's a place where we study Torah. So Vespasian probably said something along the lines of, well, are you going to be loyal to Rome or are you going to continue to revolt while you study this Torah? And he said, oh, we want to study Torah. We'll be loyal, pay our taxes. We're, we realize the revolt is not a good idea. So he says, uh, you want us to go to this place, Javna, 45 minutes uh, away from Jerusalem? Well, nowadays, probably 45 minutes away from Jerusalem or so. And study Torah in the yeshiva, what do we really care as long as you're going to be loyal to Rome? So Judaism survives that way. And basically, uh, he, this is really where rabbinic Judaism takes off in, in Yavna. Yavna is considered like a, a, denotes a turning point in Judaism. So wh where does the story of him going before? Uh, be, oh, and the other part is when he goes before Vespasian, he pops out of the coffin and says, you're going to be the next emperor of Rome. So where does this story come from? This is obviously the Josephus story being dressed up again. If you remember, we spoke about when he was in uh, Jopetta up north and the Romans have, he, he and his men are, are trapped. He surrenders to Vespasian and says, you're going to be the next emperor of Rome. And Vespasian takes a liking to him. He, Josephus claimed this was a prophecy. Believe me, it was no prophecy. It was simple uh, political calculation that uh, they were going to lose to the Romans. He might as well surrender. And he was simply, uh, Vespasian was the strong, strongest Roman figure. The Roman emperors had been very unstable. So it was just a, a, a smart political insight on his part and probably something a lot of people could have come up with. So what we really do know what happened is, is uh, Yochanan ben Zakkai uh, makes a deal with the Romans, uh, basically peace with the Romans, at least as far as he and his followers are concerned in return for being able to study Torah in Yavna. And the story about him going out of be, being escorted out in the coffin and saying you're going to be the next emperor of rome that's simply put into the talmud it makes a good it makes a good story and it's based on josephus's account which uh is written down before the talmud is canonized so interesting story but nevertheless it's important in the sense that we are seeing why rabbinic judaism or the pharisaic movement which more or less becomes rabbinic judaism is able to survive Okay, why don't the Essenes survive? Well, the Essenes, uh, even if we go beyond the Qumran sect, who we said are most likely Essenes, uh, even if you account for all the different Essene groups, they were still a small movement, and they're simply not able to survive the revolt. As we discussed last time, the Qumran sect simply abandoned ship as the Romans are coming. They're not going to stick around for it, probably hope to return and never are able to reconstitute and return. Unfortunately, uh, in 1947, the scrolls are discovered. And the Zealots, which Josephus called the fourth sect, he also calls them the Sakari, which are the daggermen. Uh, uh, he, he likes that, he prefers that term. It's a negative term. As we said, he's writing under Flavian patronage. So if you call someone a Zealot, it could, it could at least have a positive connotation. Someone is passionate for God, you think about Pinchas being a zealot. That's a good thing he's a zealot, according to the Torah. I know the rabbis uh, have some concerns about him, but nevertheless, 
uh, God considers this a good thing, his zealotry. So uh, Sakari is like a daggerman, someone who is a nefarious figure who's running around terrorizing you, pulls a dagger out of his cloak and uh, kills you because you're a Roman sympathizer. So these people, they lost the revolt. So obviously uh, they disappear as well. Now, of course, there are is this the diaspora revolt against Rome by the Jews later on? And then, of course, the Bar Kokhba revolt again. So the mentality doesn't necessarily go away. In fact, during the Bar Kokhba revolt, if anything, it re increases because we have during the uh, during the uh, revolt against Rome that, that leads to the destruction of the first temple, which you're talking about now, you have a certain messianic fever. When Bar Kokhba revolts against the Rome, it's much more pronounced to the point where the leading rabbi of the day, Rabbi Akiva, rather than making peace with Rome, endorses, uh, unfortunately makes a mistake, an endorser of Bar Kokhba, which has a messianic overtone, the son of a star, like a Ko Kohav star, he endorses him as the Mashiach, as the Messiah, and he puts up a great fight, but at the end of the day, it's an utter disaster. And what happened to Christian, we'll call them Christian Jews, I know last week we spoke about that a little, and Susan had some good insights how to look at the Christianity dividing out of Judaism. But we'll just say here in Schiffman documents this in his book, Text to Tradition, that over time, Christians gradually split from Judaism. But by the time the Bar Kokhba, Kokhba revolt rolls, rolls around, they really seem to be at this point their own group. And as we know, historically over a period of time, they simply are their own group. So who are the last left standing? The Pharisees slash rabbinic group. So that's, that's why they basically over time survived. They're the last man standing, shall we say. Rabbi, I have a question. Aida. There is a book called The Zealot, who, which is supposed to be about Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So when they use the term zealot in that book, do you think they were having a theory that he was part of the group that we're talking about as the zealots? Or you don't know? Well, the group that we're talking about as zealots really seems to become active. I think Jesus has been dead for a bit by this. We start seeing these Sakari, <laughs> these dagger men or, or zealots really become active in the, fi in the, in the 50s or so. And then we, the, the, the Great Revolt really starts in 66 against Rome. Uh, Jesus, according as, as a 30 or 33, most people uh, think is uh, he meets his end. So uh, Susan or whoever could correct me if I'm, that's not totally accurate. But yeah, sure I, I think what uh, basically the dates look like is that roughly in 30, uh, he dies. And then in 70 is the um, in 70 is the destruction of the temple. And then 135 is Bar Kokhba. There's a lot of distance between these dates. And it'd really be interesting to hear you uh, reflect on how those things really are very separate events in today's idea of time. I mean, 30 years is a fairly long time. Right, right. So that, that's a good point in a sense. We, we want to re remember that people, I mean, people throw, just as we throw around terms, liberal, conservative, um, I don't know, you could come up with, I'm sure we could come up with a lot of these terms, terms which have been around for a while. They don't necessarily mean they don't necessarily mean the same thing. And not to get overly political, and people make political arguments and points. What did it mean to be a Republican or a Democrat during uh, the 1800s vis-a-vis -vis nowadays? And you could hear the talking heads go on and on about go on and, on and pontificate about this type of stuff. So similarly, yeah, you have terms where someone may say he's a zealot, but my guess without reading the book, Aida, is it doesn't mean a zealot in the way in which uh, Josephus is using the term or when we use the term to uh, talk about people who 25, 30 years later are working towards revolt against Rome. They may, they may, they may have be viewing him as a zealot more in terms of he has a, a true religious passion, but at least my reading shows as far as as far as uh, the historical uh, figure of Jesus goes, and even the way he's portrayed, to the best of my knowledge, in the Gospels, he wasn't really he wasn't really fermenting for a revolt against Rome per se. What what the Jewish authorities and the Romans wouldn't like about what at least they seem to say think his message is, he's talking about an end of days where God's kingdom comes, 
and if you're the Romans or if you're if you're the the Jewish priest who basically want to keep peace with the Romans, you don't want someone running around stirring up this idea. The end of war, the end of the time is coming. God's kingdom is coming to this world. You want to basically keep the status quo. So I don't think uh, my guess is they're not referring to him as a zealot and let's uh, take on the Romans. But he he's a zealot and he has a, a religious passion for the way he sees the world. And which gospel is it in? He says, give give what to Caesar is to Caesar, what is God unto God. I don't remember. I have okay, but, but that's a one of that's that's not my that's not my imagination. That's a one of the gospels, right? Yes, it is. It's okay. Dr. Matthew. Yeah, so I, I I've heard I've heard historians looking at him as a historical figure, basically saying he was not he was not engaged in a overt zealot type of behavior as we're going to take Rome head on. What 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 he is what he seems to be going for, at least in a historical context, is basically saying we have to behave in a certain way because the end of days is coming. Now, again, if you're a Roman, you don't necessarily want to hear that because you can't get people stirred up and one thing leads to the next, but it wasn't this overt, let's pick up our, let's pick up our swords and go to war against Rome like the uh, later on the Zealots, in fact, do do. Uh, I had a, I'm sorry, I had another thought about that just on top of what you were saying, Rabbi, uh, which is uh, to Aida that, that there is a whole school of thought, and I think it's really uh, sort of fictional, uh, that it assigns uh, the role of Jesus as a political zealot in order to give some uh, uh, rationale, if you will, for why the Romans put him to death. I, I think it's, I, I don't see anywhere in the scripture that says that, but it certainly is a political thought and you'll see several books written on it, not only the one you're referring to, but I think there are a few others. So that was just my thought about it. Right. And I think uh, just I think someone else wants to say something. But just yeah. before I forget, let me just say one just to interject and just remind people again. So we the, the earliest Gospels uh, are written about 30 years after uh, after Jesus dies. Even the, uh, the epistles of Paul are in the 50s. So 15, 20 years. So it's very easy for later on, as Susan kind of alluded to, is people to read back 15, 30 years later their own agenda and now that Jesus has become a well-known figure, try to uh, use him as a bit of an empty vessel and try to color him uh, for political or ideological purposes using uh, their lens. Okay, I think it was Scott or someone was trying yeah, to speak? It was me, Rabbi. I just had a thought. Going back to Aidea's original question about whether you know Jesus could have been a, a zealot, but we one of the things we haven't talked about is the Habakkuk Pesher, which is one of the Dead Sea Scroll documents, which is extremely controversial. And in that, you get a, a sense that whoever these this group of people were, that the Gospels call Christians or, or people give the term, suppose that what we're looking at, the documents that we that we're reading, these scrolls, the Habakkuk Pesher, are highly attributable to this Dead Sea Scroll sect. And they weren't written in Greek, they were written in Hebrew. And we know how strict these, these people were. And we know there was confrontations with this people and Roman sympathizers. And if, if what we're looking at, keeping in mind who wins the war, not the Jews, but the Romans, and the word, the language of the Romans is Greek. So the gospels are written in Greek. And if they could be authored by the Romans who are hiding who these first group, whatever you wanna call them, Christians, Essenes, Zealots. If we're looking at what could have been authored by they themselves, not censored by the Romans, then maybe very, very well, maybe what we're looking at is the, the gospels are telling a Roman version of who these people were and the Dead Sea Scrolls are telling a version that are uncensored by Romans that the first so-called Christians were just 180 degrees, not what the Gospels say they were, but what the Dead Sea Scroll says they were. And I think if we talked about the Habakkuk Pesha, it would become more clear how these issues gel that kind of supports that view. That remember, the victors... They write the history, not the losers. And the Romans won. And the Gospels' authorship are written right during 
the war. And it raises really interesting thoughts that it wasn't written during Jesus's life, but it was written in late 60s, right when the war is going on. Okay, so that, as, uh, thank you, Scott. So that's a wonderful point. And in one of the later lectures, we are going to actually be looking at the Habakkuk Pesher, which is one of the uh, yeah. well-known Dead Sea texts, which is really basically Habakkuk, the, uh, the prophet's writings with the embedded commentary. So we're going to see how the sect looked at him. And as Scott points out, not through the terms of filter, not through the terms of filtered, well, we have to worry about how our, how our, uh, how are the Romans going to view such work or Jews who are sympathetic to uh, view these types of works that we're simply going to see uh, the way they really read the text. So that's, that's the wonderful point and we will be getting to that. Okay, so thank you, Aida. We got, really got a lot out of that question. Okay, let's, uh, let's move on. So here we have the term rabbi starts to now uh, pop up or rav. Originally, it's an Aramaic word, actually, as we said, Aramaic was really the uh, spoken language of the Jews, being that Jews had been exiled to Mesopotamia and uh, picked up Aramaic had been uh, uh, one of the popular spoken languages there, really. So you have a situation where even on the ground in ancient Israel, Judea, you have often the spoken language is Aramaic, uh, like in the Talmud, it's a very Hebraicized Aramaic, but just like Yiddish is a, a combination of, uh, of Hebrew and German. So it really seems to be like Aramaic with a lot of uh, Hebrew thrown in, but nevertheless, they're speaking Aramaic and you have Hebrew is basically the language of the rabbis and study and uh, a scholarly type of language. But the term rabbi comes into Hebrew here and Rabbi would be my teacher is a popular uh, was a popular term here. It's a term of affection. My teacher. Uh, it starts to appear now in Christian scriptures as well. The term uh, the term Rav Rabbi, and it's used by followers of Jesus and John the Baptist. So it's popular in this time at these emerging Christian circles uh, as well. Can I okay. Rabbi? Can I so? It's Outside of uh, ancient Israel, are, are there Jewish communities in Iraq or, or, or any? I mean, I know there's one in Rome, but yes. are they? Are the, 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 short, the simple answer is yes, there are. Uh, just to back up, as Jews are exiled after the destruction of the first temple and wind up in Babylon and, and Persia, like we uh, the store, the Megill at Esther is historically placed after the destruction of the first temple. Uh, shortly before the uh, shortly before the uh, rebuilding of the second temple is built. In fact, there's a line in Miguel at Esther, uh, which Esther says, uh, where Esther says to Achashverosh, "Can I make a request of you?" When she do, that's when she goes and approaches him, and she's nervous to approach him, and but she works up the courage to do it. And he says, "Okay, I could give you up to basically anything. I'll give you up to half my kingdom." So the rabbis understand that to mean she's really asking, I'll give you anything short of letting the Jews rebuild their temple, because uh, perhaps the concern was if I let the Jews rebuild their temple, it will fan nationalistic flames, and perhaps other groups will say, if we let the Jews go back and build their temple in Jerusalem, why should you rule over us? We want to go back to where from or be able to declare independence from you as well. So that, so, but, but my point to answer Jonathan's question is, you have Jews there, and if you look at Ezra and Nehemiah, those historical accounts, you'll see that when uh, there's uh, when um, when a, a, a Cyrus says to the Jews, "You want to go back and build your temple?" Uh, sounds great to me. It's only a small group of Jews get up and go. Most are living in uh, most most stay in uh, Babylon and Persia. So yes, there's already exilic Jewish communities uh, that uh, that have been around for a, a fair amount, of, quite a bit of time at this point. So uh, does that answer your question, Jonathan? But, yeah. So did they? I don't know how you're supposed to know this. Do they interact with Sakai and the, the, the schools that show up in in ancient Israel? Do they send money because they feel bad? I mean. Yeah, so I mean, there are there, there there are record there are records just like Jews in America have the UJA and all these charities, which at least in part I mean UJA does stuff in America uh, in North America as well and World Jewelry, but you have all these American Jewish organizations that focus on supporting the Jewish homeland in Israel, 
yes, there are records of people basically saying, I don't want to make Aliyah, though, uh, I'm comfortable here. However, I'll be happy to send you a check, uh, ch- send you money. So uh, abso- absolutely. Now, now where, where these communities broke down as far as the revolt against Rome and who's supporting what, that, that I don't know about. But um, you have Jews in Mesopotamia, you have Jews in, uh, in Alexandria, Egypt. I mean, we have the story of the writing of the Septuagint about uh, 250 before the common era. So this is like over, well over 200 years before this revolt against Rome. And, and the story is, uh, the real story is that uh, the Jews need the Torah translated into Greek simply because you have a lot of Jews living in Greek speaking Egypt. So uh, absolute, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and and maybe like nowadays you have, listen, if you go around and ask different Jews about feelings about Israel and uh, policies, uh, Israeli policies, uh, you're going to get different, you're going to get different responses. You have different Jewish, American Jewish organizations uh, who run the gamut uh, as well uh, on what they think Israel should be doing and and what type of support. Uh, Likewise, you may have had different feelings and interactions, even though I don't, I I don't know, you'd really need someone who is a real expert in in the field to really uh to really have that degree of knowledge i could i add something to that uh Please. just a little bit later when you see the stories of uh, paul in uh places like romans uh what you see is that he he's going after uh trying to convert gentiles that's his primary task but along the way he collects money uh during that period of time which is roughly uh, before the destruction of the temple, let's say, uh, so say somewhere in the 50s, uh, and he is collecting money from both Jews and Gentiles to bring back to Jerusalem uh, for the Jews who are suffering. Uh, so you see that whole northern uh, tier of the Mediterranean has a lot of Jewish, Jewish communities in it, which is what he uses as his base point for going out and uh, and basically recruiting Gentiles. Yeah, that's a wonderful point. He's going, he's go. I read a book, uh, I read a book about it actually. Uh, he, he's going out and he's establishing these churches basically for the Gentile community, but he's also feels he has a connection to Jerusalem church and he goes to Jerusalem church uh, and he's going and he wants to bring him money and there's some sort of conflict and I think historians are not quite clear exactly what even happened. But uh, it doesn't end. It doesn't end particularly well. And next thing you know, he is uh, he's in Rome on trial. Is that correct, Susan? Uh, yeah, sort of. He doesn't end up on trial in trial in Rome until right up against, probably right up against the destruction of the temple. So I'm going to say at the end of his life, which was something like I don't know, sixty something, sixty five. Yeah, I've heard I've heard sixty five as <clears throat> a date for one. Yeah, that's a dies. good that's a good date to use. And when you get in there, that's where he was arrested and taken by the Romans to Rome to stand trial. And um, <clears throat> I I don't know how much it had to do with uh, him going back and forth or bringing money, but <clears throat> independent of that, he was bringing money to the uh, Jewish groups uh, Jewish groups in Jerusalem. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, okay. So good question, Jonathan. Another good discussion. Oh, wait, there was one point I, I missed there. Okay. So uh, we should note that the first Pharisaic texts we have, uh, which really are put in our final version, there are, there are oral traditions of these texts, but the first when they really start, they start to write them down, uh, and we have a standardized version, is 200 common era. So that's uh, quite a bit. You remember Qumran was evacuated or abandoned. In 68, we have the Christian scriptures. Uh, John is the latest of the Gospels, uh, around 90 or so. So this is this is well over 100 years later. We have the first real Pharisaic text under Yehuda Hanasi. Judah the Prince are being put into their, uh, put into a, a finalized form. So keep that in mind as we uh, talk about rabbinic text here. So the first rabbinic text is the Mishnah. So it's the, uh, my, oh, my bullet's all the way up here. It's the earliest uh, Pharisaic text. Okay, so uh, the Mishnah basically is written like uh, a bullet code, more or less, basically telling, telling you uh, what does it really mean to keep kosher? What does it really mean to keep Shabbat? 
the Torah has these very general ideas about keeping Shabbat. We have a couple of examples. We know B'nai Yisrael, the children of Israel, aren't supposed to be collecting man on, uh, on Shabbat. God gives them a double portion. Uh, we know someone is executed for uh, gathering and we're told not to light a fire. But it certainly doesn't list out 39 uh, malachot or forbidden activities. The Mishnah does for us. So these are these are these oral teachings, uh, which were depending if you follow the Gaonim, the uh, the rabbis right after the close of the Talmud in Baghdad will tell you these were traditions that God gave over to Moses. Basically, the Torah is a, a very terse written version he gave to Moshe, and now this these are the oral uh, teachings that accompany the Torah. So the Rambam says or Ramadani says, no, nope, that's not quite what it is. God instead taught Moses how to figure it out himself by studying the Torah. So there's a there's a machloket, a debate as to how exactly the what exactly or how exactly the Mishnah originally formed. But practically speaking, it doesn't really matter in the sense that it's considered by the Pharisees and the rabbis who come after them as authoritative, authoritative in other words. This is the way we're going to understand the written text. We're not going to view it as a Pharisees and later on the Karaites would understand it as simply uh, keeping Shabbat means don't light a fire. So we're going to sit in the dark and not light a fire. No, what it means is you can't, you could have a fire going before Shabbat. You just can't light it on Shabbat. You also have to abstain from all these other 39 labors as well, not just the few that are, that are explicitly mentioned in the Torah. So that's the Mishnah. It's divided into six volume seeds, which is Zerayim. Uh, it talks about the first, and uh, there's different volumes. So the first one is, uh, is Zerayim, uh, and Zerayim is Brachot, because it's talking about the blessings you make from what you harvest. Uh, the the fa famously starts off also, uh, when do you, uh, speaking about blessings, when do you recite the Shema, which isn't really a blessing, it's words of Torah, but it's part of the prayer service, which includes blessing. So we have uh, Moed, which talks about, uh, which it talks about festivals, is, is the second one, uh, Shabbat and the, hol the holidays, as we say, by the way, uh, let's see who could figure this out. Which of the biblical festivals does not have its own tractate or mesecta in the Talmud? Anyone? Can anyone hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, just making sure. Yeah. Okay, it's Shavuot. Why? Because you think about it, there's no particular mitzvah really associated with Shavuot. I mean, we read the Ten Commandments, but that's really part of the Torah reading. A lot of people, myself, have a minhag to eat dairy one day or if not both days. But there's no particular uh, mitzvah, mitzvah like Lula Venetrag or Vesader because it's a celebration of the entire Torah. Uh, so, uh, so you don't need a, a particular, like if you talk about Sukkot or Pesach, you need a volume of the Torah basically to really tell you how to celebrate the holidays. In Shavuot, you don't. Now, interestingly enough, you do have one on Megillah, which is a rabbinic holiday, but that tells us how it basically goes into how to celebrate Purim. As we've said, there is no uh, volume on Hanukkah because the rabbis were resistant to Hanukkah for a variety of reasons. And later on, the people uh, almost force it upon the rabbis and the rabbis reluctantly, reluctantly uh, endorse it. It's, it's not even forget about the Talmud. It's not even in the uh, Jewish uh, Tanakh at all. It's saved in the uh, Septuagint, uh, in the Greek uh, edition, which is the basis for the Catholic Bible. Then we have Nashim, dealing with issues of women, such as menstruation, child, having children, those type of things, and Ziki, which are damage, damages, uh, holy items, uh, Kochim. And uh, this is actually going to be a Kochim, it's going to be important, uh, and also uh, the pur purity as well, Taharot. Uh, because the uh, the Essenes are very into this, and this was really very important back in the ancient day, particularly when there was a temple issues of purity. As we said, the Essenes are uh, really protesting the uh, lack of purity in the temple, as they see it, that the, the Sadducees who are conducting business in the temple really don't get it right. They're not acting 
they're not treating holy items correctly. They're not really being as pure as one should. And they separate themselves into this cloistered community in order that they can be pure. Now, each of these uh, sections of the Mishnah uh, has 12, 8 to 12 tractates dealing with specific issues. Most of them have a Mishnah, which is more or less a bullet, a bullet point section. Uh, and most of them also have the Gemara, which is the second part, which is more of like a dialectic discussion where the rabbis talk about the bullet points in the Mishnah and arguing over what exactly these bullet points mean or, or express or arguing uh, over how to best keep these laws. So uh, not all of them do. Like, for instance, Pirakei Avot is actually is the Mishnah Avot, but there's no Gemara section, but most have a Gemara as well. Now, there's also a debate as uh, did the Mishnah make new laws or put old laws into practice. And the, the, the traditional Jewish approaches, these were really a codification or a writing down of old laws, particularly as Jews are going into exile, they can't rely on oral traditions like they used to. To say they were simply new traditions, this is something like, for instance, the, Sa the Sadducees must have been saying, is what, what's with this? We have a written Torah here. You're giving me all of this stuff about you're supposed to uh, wash your hands and make a bracha at home before you eat bread. No, you don't need to do that. The washing, all these ritual abusions, that's really for the priesthood and the temple. You guys are basically making up a new religion. The uh, rabbinic, uh, the Pharisaic rabbinic approach is no, these are, these are, these are traditions which uh, have been handed down, which are simply codifying. And my guess is there is an element of truth in both in simply that uh, you, you have old traditions as well as traditions, these old traditions often, often develop in, uh, in a sedimentary fashion over time and may, uh, and may, expand, and may expand as well. So uh, that's probably what's going on here. In, in, in addition to the Mishnah, we have these Tosefta, which comes from the Hebrew word Yosef, Joseph, or Musaf, which means addition, like Joseph is an addition to the family here. So these are teachings uh, which are uh, supplement, like Mishnaic type of teachings, which aren't in the Mishnah. You could often find them like in the back of a Mishnah. You'll find these uh, teachings as well, which have been preserved. Oh, okay. This screen popped up all at once. Uh, so we have the Talmud here, which we said is a, the Mishnah and the Gemara here. Now there are two different versions of the Talmud, which is a little confusing. We have the Talmud Yerushalmi, a Jerusalem Talmud, which is about 400 of the uh, Common Era. It gets it gets uh, codified, and it focuses on legal process and the rationale for specific laws. The more authoritative of the two works two works is the Babylonian or Talmud Bavli, which is codified about 100 years later. So it's bigger, it's more encyclopedic in nature. And also, besides these uh, legal uh, discussions about legal process and rationale for laws, also has more folklore or agada, which are stories as well. Like one of exa the, is an example is a nice story about when uh, Miriam, Moshe's older sister, is a six-year-old kid, according to the Talmud. Her parents say, what's the use of having more children? This is before Moshe is born. If we have a son, Pharaoh is just going to kill him anyway. Uh, life stinks. Uh, being a Hebrew in Egypt, you're going to you have to work as a slave. And she's a very precocious young child, according to the Talmud, and is busy arguing with them and ultimately convinces them, nope, you have to have faith in God and have more children. So you have these, uh, you have these really wonderful stories in there like that. Okay, the similarities between the Pharisees as described by uh, Josephus and the rabbinical text. So Josephus and rabbinical texts, which uh, are basically saying, painting the Pharisees, uh, Pharisaic behavior in a similar fashion, which is good because they're basically validating each other. You have compatibilism, which means you find middle ground, particularly a good example is between free will and uh, pre, a type of their free will and predestination. As we said in like maybe two weeks ago or so, the uh, Sadducees rejected any idea, any uh, any idea of really free will. They said it's predetermined who is good and who is bad and who's being saved. Uh, that's the Essenes, excuse me, said that everything is predetermined who's uh, being good and who's uh, who's saved. 
the Sadducees said, no, it's all a matter of free will. Uh, and it's a Perakei vote, which is the rabbinic text. We have Rabbi Akiva. He's uh, living right around the time of Bar Kokhba, 135. Common Era says all is foreseen, yet we have free will, which is kind of having it a bit of both ways, saying all is foreseen. So God understands what's going to happen, yet he gives you free will, which you could look at, uh, I look at it in a certain sense of God understands what your decisions are going to be, even though you're going to make your decisions. He beforehand knows what's going to happen, being that he's God. In other words, he has the DVD of your life, the movie of your life, even though you get to direct it. He knows what it's going to, how it's going to run, even though you haven't even been born yet, but you're still directing it and running it yourself. And it also may mean that all is foreseen that we're born into uh, certain families and certain conditions and places and economic conditions and all that, or yeah, person, uh, genetic traits you're born with, all of these will affect your life, no doubt about it. Uh, but within that box, you still have free will. So they're kind of giving it to you a bit both ways. And uh, it's not really surprising in a sense the Pharisees kind of win is when you take these more extreme views, they're not really particularly practical. You're going to tell people you have no free will whatsoever. First of all, even as we're going to talk about with the Essene or the Qumran sect, when you have an intense initiation process and your people have to show they're worthy, do you really is it really is it really feasible to believe that someone you're going to say, well, it's been predetermined whether you're in or out? No, of course the person's going to do everything to show they're in. Now, afterwards, you could say, aha, it was predetermined all the time. But that's kind of it's like it's like talking about a sports team and saying. Uh, they're a Cinderella team. I remember after the Giants defeated the Patriots in the, the Super Bowl when the Giants were going for uh, the Patriots were going for that undefeated season. After the pack, people were saying, well, they were the Giants were a Cinderella team to pull that off. And someone on sports radio said, well, come on, give me a break. Uh, you're a Cinderella team after the fact when you win. So, uh, so, but uh, in, in the same in the same light, in a sense, uh, even people who are believing in predetermination, predestination, you know, they're trying as hard as they can. Uh, so, certainly, uh, on the other hand, to say everything is a matter of uh, free will is also problematic. We have these debates nowadays in our society where uh, we talk about how much government should intervene to help uh, to help people and. People will say, well, it's a matter you have to pull yourself up out of bootstraps. And then the other person will say, no, no. What about uh, leveling the playing people? Clearly, people have advantages and disadvantages. And we have these this type of discussions nowadays. So you see here that the Pharisees kind of have a, a position which is a little more uh, easier to perhaps implement by often taking more of a, perhaps a middle ground approach here. Now, it, does, it doesn't mean that sometimes uh, one-sided approaches aren't the correct approaches, and I'm not saying you always have to take a moderate approach, but you could see over a long term, particularly as Judaism is going through uh, a, a big transitional state, uh, you need sometimes positions which are going to be able to be adopted to changing times. And if you have an ultra-strict, uh, rigid position, that not, is not always going to uh, do the job. Okay, so I said Qumran was certainly not a centrist community. They gravitated towards very particularly ritual and extremes regarding ritual and purity and exclusivity as well. And you, you think about it, it's a good example. It's particularly hard to be exclusive as Jews are, are going into exile to, to keep your community going if you have a small community to begin with. And then on top of it, you're very exclusive as well. It's simply just not something that you could really uh, transport as uh, you're being scattered. So it's not really surprising in that sense that the sect was not able to reconstitute later at, uh, at the Qumran site. Now, it was believed that rabbinic Judaism became the norm shortly after the destruction, or almost immediately after the destruction of the Second Temple. But now scholars believe that really these minority groups in some degree or another really uh, hang on for uh, hang on for quite a while, and this is, seems to be attested to in the scrolls and Josephus as well, and we'll talk more about that later. And just to give you an example of what I mean here, the Saracens deny the uh, the oral law, and later on the Karaites in the eighth century, much later on again, deny the oral law. Now, as we said in the other history class uh, based on Ruderman's works, the Karaites were 
as much as anything, an umbrella group of people who didn't like rabbinic authority, and not all of them were particularly ideologically driven by Karaitic, uh, Karaitic ideology. And nowadays you have people join political parties and groups. I mean, in, in Israel, you have people uh, basically uh, basically have a similar ideology to Netanyahu, for instance, and are very explicit about it and just say, it's time he goes. Uh, we don't like a, we don't we don't like him. It's not even his policy per se. It's him. So uh, in a similar light, I mean, you have these political dynamics really don't change, and you had people join the Karaites who may who weren't necessarily particularly concerned about the Karaitic philosophy, but they wanted to be part of a sizable group who can challenge the rabbis. But th the point I'm making here is that this Sadducean uh, school of thought, at least is underground and then in the eighth century is able to emerge and really give the rabbis a, a run for their money there, even though eventually, of course, the rabbis win yet again. I have, okay. I have a question, Rabbi. Yes, yes. Uh, I, uh, I've been following a little bit about contemporary Karaites and um, as I understand it, the Karaite philosophy, if you will, <clears throat> is that they reject uh, rabbinic authority, but they follow uh, without, without question of the Torah. Let's call it the Torah. In some cases, it's just the Torah, as I understand it, and in some cases, both Torah and the entire Tanakh. Uh, could you comment on that or answer that? Sure. I actually so, so, am very so, confused. Yeah. So, so, so their basic ideology <laughs> in theory is that they basically reject rabbinic, uh, rabbinic writing. So you'd make law from the Torah itself, as opposed to uh, viewing the Torah through the Mishnah and the Gemara, the Talmud, as we spoke about. So my, the example is the Torah says you can't have a flame on Shabbat. So that means you wouldn't have a flame on Shabbat. So some of these ideas, let's say about uh, eating warm food on Shabbat, which isn't a mitzvah per se. I mean, you, you can fulfill your obligations to have, eat on Shabbat without eating warm food, but you have these traditions that you should have warm food on Shabbat because this is really a polemic against the Karaites who are saying uh, you couldn't even warm food, keep food warm on Shabbat because you couldn't, uh, you can't have the flame going where rabbinic Judaism says, well, it doesn't mean you have to, can't have a flame. It means you can't light the flame, but you could certainly have a flame for lighting or like we call the blech in Yiddish, uh, like a hot plate of sorts uh, that could be used to keep food warm on Shabbat. And the rabbis say, well, it's good. You're enhancing Shabbat. It's a Oneg Shabbat, you're really enjoying Shabbat more if you're eating hot food. So, uh, so they basically reject, uh, their liter literalists would be a fair way of putting it uh, in understanding the, understanding the Torah. Now, from what I understand, ironically, they do accept the rabbinic, uh, the rabbinic view of what the entire Jewish Tanakh, the greater Jewish biblical canon is, which is kind of ironic because they're rejecting rabbinic authority, but they are saying, okay, we, the books that come after the five books that are later on added by the rabbis to this biblical corpus that they do accept. So I, I guess their argument would be that uh, at a certain point, at a certain point, um, it's fair, it's fair to add books into what your holy scripture on one hand, but on the other hand, their practices should be, um, should just be derived from the Torah itself. And, and by the way, um, uh, when you look at uh, when you look at how Jewish law is made, uh, laws are, are Jewish law is developed from pasukim verses from the five books of of Moses. You don't use the uh, Navim, uh, the prophets, or the Ketuvim, the writings per se. Pull out verses to make law. They could be used to support rabbinic laws. That's called an atzmachta, which means it's like samuch to support to support. It's being if it's being a support. The one that's jumping into my head, I, I think about it because we do it on on Hallel, on Rosh Hodesh all the time. Is the rabbis uh, say that you're supposed to make a bracha before you eat? Birkat Hamazon, that's derived from the Torah itself. Birkat Hamazon, the grace after meals. But the idea of making a blessing before you eat is completely rabbinic in nature. But the rabbis do use the verse Hashemayim, Hashemayim, Hashem Laharat Satan Lefnei Adam that the heavens uh, are God's domain, but the uh, earth He's given to humans. So the rabbis say, "Well, we're good." That gives us uh, support to to say that you should make a, a blessing before you eat, because basically the, everything is God's and He gives us this world, but it's a gift. So 
if you uh, make a blessing before eating, then you're taking the food correctly. If you don't, they basically say you're a ganav, you're a thief. A ganav in Hebrew is the word uh, you're stealing if you don't make a blessing before you eat. So that's an example of uh, not the rabbis not using uh, not using uh, the prophetic works or the uh, ketuvim, the writings, to make a biblical law or say something's a biblical law, but yet nevertheless using it for support. All right, let me uh, X out of here. We see we have our next lecture again. So uh, let's open it up to Q&A uh, before we go into uh, Myra. So the, the destruction of the temple is uh, by any measure an unmitigated disaster. So what was the, I don't know, commentary? I mean, I, I mean, was it, I mean, you didn't touch on it here. Were there writings and great gnashing of teeth about why was God punishing us or what, what happened to the temple? I mean, this is just- Oh, sure, yeah, a ab absolutely, Jonathan. That is, that is a great question. And as I like to point out, uh, the reason why the temple was really destroyed, uh, lightning may strike me first, but I actually heard this from my rabbi growing up who was a orthodox, modern Orthodox rabbi, Rabbi Wahlberg. In a sermon once he said, let me tell you a little secret. The reason why the temple was destroyed, the second temple was destroyed because the Romans were stronger. And the rabbinic faction was basically t telling the zealots this. <clears throat> Picking a fight, you will not win, this is stupid. And the zealots obviously didn't listen to them. But the rabbis are not content. They want they want to pull something more out of it than that. So they say, why did the Jews, why was the second temple destroyed? Because of the sin of sinat chinam, baseless hatred, which they're not totally off the mark in the sense, if you look at the historical, historical record, and granted it's uh, through the prism primarily of Josephus, who wants to make the Jews look like they're a bunch of out of control people who need the Romans to impose law and order on them because he's writing this under pa uh, Flavian patronage. <laughs> so he certainly has that uh, point of view. Uh, but nevertheless, it is clear that the Jews were engaged in fighting with each other as well. And uh, the rabbis want that to be the main takeaway. Why was the second temple destroyed? For the sin of Sinat Chinam, Jew fighting against Jew. The most famous story, it's uh, from the Talmud and Gitin, and it's often talked about around Tisha B'Av time, Um, the story is that this uh, Jerusalem big shot is having one of these power parties. He's inviting all the big shots, including the leading rabbis. And he sends, if my memory is correct, he sends this uh, invitation to Bar Kamsa uh, and it, his friend. And it says it goes to Kamsa. I may be reversing the names. It's been a while since I looked at the story, but the point's the same. And instead of it showing up at his friend and inviting him to the party, it shows up at his arch nemesis. And his arch nemesis sees the invitation to the party and says, oh, he wants to make up with me. And this is a, a great place to be seen. All the big shots in Jerusalem will be there. Well, he shows up and wants to go into the party and the host sees him and says, what is that guy doing here? Get him out. That's my enemy, I hate his guts. And the guy says, don't throw me out in front of everyone. It's really embarrassing, please. And the host says, get him out. And he says, well, I'll pay for half the meal. Get him out. I'll pay for the entire meal. Get him out. They kick him out in front of uh, everyone. The rabbis uh, who are there are, uh, remain silent as this guy is humiliated in front of all the big shots. And after, and after that, the humiliated guy says, I'm going to get even with these people. So what does he do? He goes to the Roman emperor and says, the Jews are planning to revolt against you. And the Roman, uh, this is a big sin, by the way, is uh, Messira. He's like informing. Uh, he's, he's getting the Jews in trouble with the secular authorities. It means, it means to like hand over. So uh, he goes to the Roman emperor and the Roman emperor says, well, let me test the loyalty of the Jews. I'll, I'll send an offering up. And if the Jews deny the offering, I'll know they're in revolt against me. Re rejecting an offering of the Roman Empire, being an emperor being sent up in Jerusalem, was something which was done. It wasn't uh, considered against Jewish law. And it was like throwing out the ambassadors. Not to accept it would be politically stupid and an act of war as well. You don't want to offend the Roman emperor. And it wouldn't have been, it, it shouldn't have been something forbidden uh, by Jewish law. 
Now, a, the story is he puts a moom, a blemish in the animal, so it's no longer uh, able, to be, uh, able to be brought to the altar. And the, the rabbis and the, the priests have a discussion because there's a bit of trouble here now. On one hand, the offering really shouldn't be brought up because it has a blemish, so it's not fit to be offered. We're talking about issues of purity and what's being fit and not fit. On the other hand, they realize not a good idea to uh, poke the Roman emperor in the eyes. So uh, there's the discussion, should they offer it anyway? But if they offer it anyway, would people think it's okay to offer up an offering which is, uh, which is blemished? And someone says, well, why don't we just kill this guy who's, uh, who's uh, trying to get us in trouble with the Roman authorities? And they decide not to. And ironically here, the uh, rabbi, Rav Afkulas, his name is, who decides not to have this guy killed, is later on blamed for having the temple destroyed and the Jews being exiled. Basically, the takeaway the Talmud learns later on is that this would have been one of these times where he should have played hardball. And they should have had this guy killed rather than kicking the can down the road. Eventually, the uh, offering winds, winds up in Jerusalem. And this part, what we do know is historically true. This story is not historically true. It may be loosely based on something true. It's basically to show all the hate that was going on Jew against Jew. What we do know, which is a start, what is historically true, is the revolt is kicked off by the Sagan. That's the assistant Kohen Hagadol, Elazar, refuses the Roman emperor's offering. So that's probably where the Talmud is taking this idea of refusing the offering. And it is uh, refused, and that kicks off the great revolt against Rome. So the, rabbi, the rabbis are looking at this basically as we should learn something beyond the fact of don't pick fights, you're going to win. That's certainly a good practical lesson. But the lesson and answer to Jonathan's question is Sinat Chinam is bad. First temple was destroyed because of the Talmud, because of Avodah Zara, idolatry, as well as Gilui Ariot, impermissible relations, and uh, Shifuch Damim, which, uh, Shifuch Damim, which means spilling blood, the three sins you're supposed to martyr yourself for instead of, uh, instead of, uh, instead of dying. I mean, you, you let yourself die instead of committing those sins. Any, any other sin, you simply uh, commit to save your life instead of those three. That's the least of destruction. The first temple, the second temple, the rabbi says, just, as, just a plain sense of sinat chinam. Jews are too busy fighting each other. It leads to the horban, to the destruction. Now, I will say one other comment. Uh, again, this uh, could get me in trouble in cer certain circles, but I'll say it anyway because uh, I like to look at things in a positive light. And yes, we look at the destruction of the temple as a horrible tragedy. I mean, the saddest day, uh, the saddest day on the Jewish calendar, calendar is Tisha B'Av. But uh, as Rabbi Akiva later, Rabbi Akiva later on says in the, in the Talmud, when uh, a series of tragedies uh, befall him, and I, like one of them is he, he has no place to stay and no light and his candle blows out. And uh, and later on, he says, well, Gamzu Latova, everything is for the good in the long run. Even this is for the good. He realizes the candle had been blown out. For instance, the Romans would have seen it and killed him. But uh, my point in regard to the destruction of the temple is, would you really want to be bringing animal sacrifices to the temple anymore? What the destruction of the temple did, if we look at it in an optimistic point of view, is it forced Judaism to evolve to the next level? Uh, and you could argue, certainly, even if we had a temple, we certainly may have evolved beyond that anyway. But it, it pushed the envelope. It's uh, one of my favorite points is that the word in Hebrew, if you listen to Israeli radio like I do to an attempt to practice my Hebrew, talk about mashbeer corona, the coronavirus, the corona, uh, the coronavirus is uh, what's uh, I'm like that in English now. I'm using the word in Hebrew. The crisis, that's the word, the crisis. So mashbeer also could mean like a birthing stool. So the idea is a crisis. And the same word in Chinese, I don't know the words, but the idea is the same. A crisis can create an opportunity as well. So even though it was a terrible crisis, it also forced Judaism to really develop and to continue the democratization of Judaism. We're no longer a Kohanim, really, the leading powers. But this rabbinic movement now is even more empowered. They were already really giving the uh, Kohanim a, uh, and the Sadducees a run for their money. But now they are firmly in power now that there's no one temple. And it, it, it lets uh, synagogue Judaism really develop. 
so one could at least uh, back then uh, on the ground, people certainly what a, a horrible tragedy. And it was a horrible tragedy in exile. But you could certainly say uh, from a historical lens, it certainly uh, let Judaism uh, develop. I'll just I'll, I'll give you I'll just end with this because I know we're, we're already late for uh, for uh, Marev as well. But I remember uh, speaking to a guy, um, there was a, a shul in New Orleans once uh, during Katrina, which was, which was flooded. And there was a famous picture of a guy uh, which went viral saving a Sefer Torah. And I was speaking to a guy from the shul once about, and he said, Katrina saved the shul. I said, what are you talking about? I saw it like everyone did on the internet. Your, the shul was destroyed. And, he, and we could relate to this uh, shul that's changed locations. And he said, no. He said, if we had stayed in that building, Shul would have not survived. We needed to get out of that building. People are reluctant to. Katrina made us get out of the building. So uh, what I'm saying is the destruction of the temple forced Judaism, uh, perhaps a little early than it would have liked to, but really to, uh, to have a more uh, a new form of Judaism, which would be more compatible for a changing world. Okay, so excellent Very question, good. Jonathan. Thank you, uh, those sticking around. I apologize for running late, but we did have a nice uh, discussion. Uh, the sticking around, please join us for Marif.